Hi, I'm Roger Michaud. At Franklin Templeton Investments, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the resources that can help make higher education more affordable. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Sun National Bank, Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Fedway Associates, Inc., the Russell Berry Foundation. And by Cone Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, one of the reasons I love this job, I don't mean like it, I mean love it, is you get to talk to people who are interesting, fascinating, and selfishly, people you've been wanting to talk to for a long time. Put the camera on that guy. Vince Curatola is an actor, writer, uh, talented guy. You may recognize, you know, not may, you do recognize him from his work on The Sopranos. Uh, played a character by the name of Johnny Sack from the uh, Lampertazzi family. <laughs> Lupertazzi. Lupertazzi, sorry, right. Lupertazzi family. I'm embarrassed that I got that wrong. I didn't even know you got it wrong. I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> <laughs> throw me off right from the beginning. Um, how much, first of, all, when did, first of all, you were a Mason. Yes. And at what point did mm -hmm. you know or sense that you were, had other abilities? Well, I come from a long construction, long line of construction people. And I had uh, a masonry business, which my son Ryan now owns. And uh, it's funny, I was always very pragmatic and practical. And my wife said to me, back in 89, uh, I was 36 years old at the time. She said, you know, you've always had this interest in acting. I used to have the Turner Classic Ruby Channel on constantly, blah, blah, blah. She said, my birthday's coming up. As a favor to me, I, I saw that Michael Moriarty, the actor, teaches acting in Manhattan. Would you go to a class? I said, and do what there? You know, Mrs. Mrs. Jones is calling me for an estimate. I think I should go. I need the work. Why am I, you know? I went, and I met him, big tall guy, very, very talented man. And it was in his apartment uh, on West 58th Street in Manhattan. And I, I, I sat there, I watched all these students working, I said, I can't do this. What am I doing here? This is ridiculous. They get up in the front, they work on a monologue, they work on the scene. I went back the next week, and I sat there silent. And I went the week after, the week after, and the week after. I never said a word. Finally, by about the seventh or eighth week, Moriarty says to me, are you going to do anything? I said, okay. And uh, I had something that I had written. I said, can I do this? He said, absolutely. So I, I wrote this little monologue about being God. And about being God, getting off the subway, walking through Manhattan, and he's completely disgusted with everything he sees. It's called The Next Voice You Hear. P.S. I wind up performing at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine as a one-man show, mm -hmm. down inside the catacombs. Talk about a beautiful place. Unbelievable and inspirational yeah. to no end. Make a long story short, he had just started on Law and & Order. And he was able to get me a small part as a court clerk, which allowed me to get my Screen Actor Guild card. You know, and then, uh, like, I had nothing to do after that. <laughs> so I'm back the in the masonry. The work was not flowing in? No, it wasn't flowing in. <laughs> so you're back doing your masonry I'm back, work? but I wrote something again called the next, uh, called Dearly Beloved. Right. And Dearly Beloved's about a guy that owns a funeral home in Brooklyn, degenerate gambler, heart as big as the world. And he's got Tony Sirico on his back. Because Tony Sirico, who played is Paulie, Paulie Walnuts, Walnuts on right? The Sopranos. But this is all way before Sopranos. And um, I turned it into a, a, a one-half-hour color film, which, by the way, now I can't mention their name. May want to make a series out of exactly. It. <laughs> so I was still, you know, 
Chris Noth became a very good friend of Christopher mine. Christopher Noth, who in fact, uh, you guys know Christopher Noth? Uh, Mr. Big in Sex and the City and... And of course, Law and Order in the yes, beginning. Yes, star. And said to me, uh, listen, I'm going to do this movie called Exiled. It's an NBC movie of the week. I need a good detective, your type, bop, 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 bop. This is back in 98. By the way, he's on The Good Wife, one <coughs> of my favorite shows. Yes, He's yes. working, right. so we don't he have to worry working. about and him. And I've been on The Good Wife several times. You have? You're a judge! I'm the new judge! You were the judge! I'm the new oh judge. Oh my God, it just hit... Oh. <laughs> You're working too, go ahead. <laughs> so he You're said, a funny judge. Thank you, thank you. He said, come and do this. I said, great. So what happened was I had an agent at the time who said, you know, there's this thing called The Sopranos. Yeah. <laughs> and I knew because Tony Sirico had already started working on it, but this is before You and Tony aired. have, you close? You were Very Tony? close. Oh. Early 90s. So I knew Tony was going, he had already filmed a couple of episodes. And I said, yeah, I don't want to go in for that. I don't want to. She said, why? I don't want to go in for that. I thought it was going to kind of be like <clears throat> Saturday Night Fever meets a, a Bronx Tale. I, I just thought it was going to be too garlicky and oily. You know? I did, who too knew, obvious? Too obvious. Who knew David Chase or what he could do? So I get to the audition on West 72nd Street in Manhattan, and I used to smoke at the time. I said, you know, I just left the set from Exile. I'm tired. I don't want to go upstairs. Let me smoke a cigarette. <laughs> so now I'm already 10 minutes late. I smoke a cigarette. You know what? It's a beautiful day. Let me look at the puppies in the window. I'll smoke another cigarette. I get upstairs about 35 minutes late. I walk into this huge room. There's one woman left sitting at a desk, papers all over. <clears throat> she said, you're late. I said, no problem. I'll go home. Thank you. Bye. I'll you didn't want this gig. No. No. She looked up at me. She said, do you have the sides they faxed you? I said, yeah, the, you know, the pages. She said, sit down, let's read this scene. It's okay. She said, I want you to meet somebody. Uh, this is a Thursday, on Monday. So she had me meet David Chase at the studio, Silver Cup. And that was my callback. So there's 45, 50, 60 guys in a room. And I'm sitting there waiting to go in to say the same things I said the other day. For the Johnny Sack role. For the Johnny Sack role. And I hear them screaming. I know the dialogue. It's here. And they're all screaming this role. I said, I got it. I go in. They said, you ready? I said, yeah, I'm ready. I whispered the entire scene. And I don't know what happened. And I began my work. Why'd you whisper? I figured you're more convincing that way. Like, if I was going to say something to you, like, what are you worried about, counselor? If I want to kill you, you'd be dead already. Do I have to scream that? So, I guess it worked. Your confidence, right? Your confidence that you show on camera, particularly uh, in the role of Johnny Sack, mm -hmm. particularly for someone who did not have this long resume. No. Where does it come from, and does it come from growing up where you grew up uh, in Englewood, New in Jersey? Englewood, yeah. Describe where you grew up and how I grew you grew up. I grew up in Englewood, New Jersey, which is a beautiful bucolic town right outside of Manhattan, actually. And <clears throat> the street that I lived on, North Woodland Street, was my paper route when I was 12 years old, whatever it was. And my customers were Tony Bennett, Jerry Vale, Sarah Vaughan, Dizzy Gillespie, Wilson Pickett, Leslie Gore, and part of the Rigby family. You saw them? Every day, if they were in town. And, you know, here I am, I'm a kid, I'm out on the front lawn. Here's, here's Tony Bennett on his bicycle in the afternoon on a Monday, going to visit Jerry Vale for coffee. And I had just seen the guy in the Ed Sullivan show the night before. It really impressed me. It really did. I said to myself, you know, maybe someday I could be in this industry, I could do something. I'm not a singer. Whatever it was. And, but I buried it, because you have to make a living, you know, and I wanted to be my own boss. And, do the ups and downs of being in your own little contracting business. It wasn't always great. My wife was very supportive, Maureen. And uh, it's weird because when I started my work in 1998, they only used me for the first season, one episode. Right. So my wife said, oh, they're going to bring you back. Yeah, okay. Well, no, no problem. Any, any calls? Any estimates? Somewhere I have to, I'm very like, you know, mm. I'm not pie in the sky. They did call back. And uh, they called back about 11 months later. Because by then the show had already aired for the first season. It was a raging success. And they wanted Johnny Sack to become something in this mosaic. Something special. Misery, you know. Do you mind if we see this clip? Absolutely. This is from season five, I believe, uh, episode 13. Uh, James Gandolfini 
is having a uh, conversation with uh, Vince, playing the characters that they play. Um, let's just say they don't trust each other all that much, the Sopranos. So? Hey. Phil has to know that punishment has been meted out, and that's all there is. And that what we are here for, in the end, is to put food on the table for our families, our sons, the future. That's what's important. He doesn't accept that. His family's smaller by one. Well then, my friend, it's up to you to make him accept it. Me? Let's talk, John, about the 500-pound elephant in the room which is that you started this cycle of bloodshed when you whacked the girl Carmine used to... Lorraine Coloso was not a girl. And what kind of a man bangs his second cousin? What are you, the freaking Cardinal? Look, you want to shut down our joint construction jobs? EK rations, fine. You want Phil to put one in one of my guys? That's gonna go a long way to making you the rich that you always wanted to be. Tell me about James Gandolfini. It's a pleasure. Why? Jimmy's a pleasure. I had met Jimmy, I guess, about six years before the show began production. And just, you know, we used to all hang out downtown at a place called Mary Lou's on West 9th Street. Was uh, Vincent Pastore there as well? Uh, Vinny was there, Tony Sirico was there, Jimmy was there, uh, a lot of guys that you see on television. That, and uh, very sweet guy, very unassuming. And I recall that when I did the first episode, I had to broker a deal for him with Uncle Junior and Hesh. This was in season one. And I said, oh my God, it's you. He said, yeah, from, you know, from three o'clock in the morning on Thursdays. And I didn't realize he was in the show. Jimmy uh, has stood up for each and every one of us. We had some yeah. negotiating things with HBO along the way that were not pleasant. So I read. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy also formed a production company where at one point he gave about eight of us from the show a piece of his production company he did not have to do, and that came with a very big check. The man is, uh, you know, without us, he doesn't want to do anything at the time. In other words, he stood up, and I recall very vividly that we were supposed to fly out the next day with our wives and to go to L.A. to stay at the Peninsula Hotel. It was for the, uh, we were nominated for a Screen Actor Guild Award Ensemble many times. We won it quite a few times. And the night before, we had all gotten faxes from HBO saying, well, as you may know, Mr. Gandolfini is not negotiating in good faith with regard to the next season. And uh, we want you to just look at the force majeure clause in your contracts. So if you can be reasonable, all of you together, and speak with him on this weekend, which we're providing for you. So we all got together in the hotel the next day and talked about these faxes. Jimmy's very cool. He's okay. Next day is Sunday. They send all the limousines to the Peninsula Hotel. We get in. We get to the Kodak Center, whatever it was, in Hollywood. Not one of us stopped for a reporter. Not one of us stopped for a picture. We all stuck together, went into the theater, and took our seats. One, and at the HBO reception afterward, Hardly any of the execs even bothered looking our way. We stood with him because he stands with us. So if we weren't going to go to work again, that's life. But for a guy like him, you, put your, you take your heart out of your chest, you put it on the floor. You know, it's interesting um, in this rough industry, and, and television, our end of television isn't the show business side you're in, but there are some similarities. Mm -hmm. Real friendship, yes. real loyalty, yes. hard to find. Um, you and your castmates from The Sopranos mm -hmm. did a very powerful video for uh, our, one of our sponsors at Hackensack University mm -hmm. Medical Center, mm -hmm. your annual meeting. You serve on the board, the foundation, foundation board up yes, there. They do, right. um, you did a video together mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. You do a lot of things together. Yes. Are you literally family? Yes, we are. We have been to more funerals, unfortunately. More funerals, more, more weddings, more family dinners than my own family, and that's no exaggeration. As a matter of fact, we were just together at Mohegan's Sun last month. The next day, uh, three of us flew to LA, uh, to uh, Florida to do something else. And we're constantly on the phone. I'll show you my cell phone. Yeah. You know. It's real. It's very yeah. real. Um, let, me, let me ask you this. 
your passion for this, mm -hmm. you know, uh, came in later in life yes. to get into this. Yeah. Was that the way it was? I know it sounds like a ridiculously uh, philosophical question, um, Vince, but was that the way it was supposed to be, or could you have somehow gotten into it at 22? I probably would have committed suicide at that age. <laughs> it's such a roller coaster business. I don't think that at that age I would have been able to handle the things that get thrown at you. I am a great believer in destiny. I really am. And I think that the fact that I was in my late third, actually, I got the part when I was in my early 40s. I think I brought something to it that I got from the humdrum of life and the humdrum of being in your own business and the disappointments. And you get to a point where it comes out in the dialogue. It's in there somewhere. And you say to yourself, you know, I remember a situation like yeah. this. Not to the extent that this is yeah. written, of course, but and you bring it and you and you feel it. it starts coming out of your eyes and you know and your hands and um, when I watch you on uh, it just hit me when I watch you uh, in uh, um, Julianne Margulies and Christopher <laughs> Noth and the folks yeah. on uh, Good Wife, one of my favorite shows, and you were there the ju as a judge. I think to myself, I wonder if Vince feels the pressure of finding work or because you've been so successful, they're looking for you all the time. You know, it's half and half. Uh, there's a lot of things you don't want that you get offered you, you really don't want to do. Right. The other problem that I have, and I think I can't speak for the cast, of course, in general, but we kind of feel like, is it ever going to be that good again? <laughs> so we're, I think we're a little careful. Once in a lifetime? Through. Yeah. You think it is? Absolutely. No movie? No movie. Although Jim and I just did two of them together. It's weird, but no movie. I just want to say that uh, for all of us uh, who... I know I speak for a lot of people, and I won't, you know, uh, just, I will say that you and your castmates um, gave us hours and hours and hours of endless pleasures, like a movie every week for a lot of years, and it was worth waiting for. Everyone said, hey, when's Chase going to do this? Yes, we, we mm -hmm. did go through that. Worth yeah. waiting for, and I thank cannot you. thank you enough. I like people who, uh, who act well and come in the studio and make my job easy, so thank I just want to thank you my for pleasure. being with us. My pleasure. Stay right there. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Vince. Stay with us one-on-one. -on -one. We'll be right back right after this. He's the reason why you should keep watching. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org, visit us online at oneonone.org, or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. Welcome to Mahiga Hope High School. <laughs> The local leadership is in full support of what the Nobility Project is doing. So it'll be eight classrooms, the library, and the computer lab. Rather than hiring a contractor and spending thousands of dollars to uh, pave this road, parents said, we'll do it. We can churn out young people who have had an opportunity to improve their lives. Here I have different towns. You're looking at uh, Turk Pipkin, founder of Nobility Project, filmmaker and director. Turk, what were we just looking at right now? That was from uh, Building Hope? That's a, a piece of the trailer from Building Hope, uh, my movie about uh, building uh, a place called Mahiga Hope High School in Kenya. Yeah. Nobility Project, just uh, set it up for us. Well, I, um, it's a, we're a global education nonprofit, and we make movies about global issues, problems, and solutions, and then we hopefully we have there's profits along the way mm -hmm. somewhere, we use those to build partner projects like that high school. Where'd the idea come from? You know, it, it came from, oddly enough, as a, here I am in, in, uh, in Patterson, New Jersey, a lot of it, the ability to do it came from The Sopranos in some ways. I had been writing. And, well, let's take a step back. Yeah. We're just leaving the studio. It was Vince Curtola. Um, Johnny Sack. Yeah, Johnny Sack. You, act, you were also on The Sopranos. You were Janice Soprano's boyfriend um, in season three, and then it brought me back a little bit in season six. Uh, I played Janice's idiot narcoleptic boyfriend. You know, it wasn't <laughs> he used enough to, to fall be a asleep all the time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I used to wake up and say, um, have you heard the good news? Right. Which, uh, right. There, there you are right there. But what does that have to do with this project? Oddly enough, I had been wanting to go from writing and acting in, t in television and film to directing my own movies, and I had been raising I wanted to work with a bunch of Nobel laureates uh, about global issues. 
and I was raising money for it. <clears throat> After I was on The Sopranos, suddenly it was much easier to raise the money to create this nonprofit and make Funny these how that happens. And uh, so David Chase, in some ways, this is like the nonprofit that David didn't know he gave birth to. And but there are other people involved in this. Well, the first interview, if you start talking about working with Nobel laureates, um, Ann Richards, a deceased now, my former and wonderful great friend. Uh, and former governor, governor, governor of, of Texas. Uh, Texas right. And Ann uh, was on our board of advisors, and the first person she introduced us to was Desmond Tutu, which is yeah. a pretty good start. But hold on, your wife's a part of this project. My wife is a co-founder and was a television and film producer and... and uh, you know, it, the whole thing got much bigger. We thought we were making one movie, <clears throat> and one movie turned into, well, these Nobel laureates are giving us their insights into the world. We need to do a little more than just a movie. And um, this, what we were watching, Building Hope, the trailer, I was invited by the Nobel laureate Wangari Maathai to come to Kenya and to plant tr trees with her group, the Green Belt Movement. And I wanted to plant trees at a school. And 12 years later, I'm still, a part of this, I've become very much a part of this community, and, we, and that's where we ended up building this high school. Dirk, make the connection for us between um, the nobility project, project and 9/11. I'm trying to, yeah, because I keep there hearing there's a connection there. And there, I'm, there definitely is one. Uh, it's a great question. I was. Uh, it's actually a lot of it comes back to the Sopranos. And when I was taping the Sopranos in 2000, I brought my 11-year-old daughter to New York with me for. An episode that I was taping because I live in Texas. And you don't have a New Jersey accent. It just hit me. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely don't. And I, I took my daughter, my 11 year old daughter, as so many people do, to the top of the World Trade Center. And we went right. around and we met everyone with their name tags from the, I, I'm from so and so with the, all these many countries. Right. And then the day of 9 11, my daughter said, What happened to all those people we met? This was just shortly before 9 11. And she said, What happened to all those people? And, you know, the answer, of course, was not a good one. And that was, I just, you know, I was somewhat frustrated, I think. My wife and I were somewhat frustrated by the response. And, and um, What do you mean? By the time we got into Iraq, I just, you know, I, this is not about politics and this I mean, not profit, it's not about politics. Our country's, our country's response, official response. Yeah, I just felt like that, that whatever the military was doing and whatever politics was doing, it was also incumbent upon individuals to find ways to connect to the world that, you know, we don't really see much about the world around us. Um, the Putting news, a flag out wasn't enough? The news uh, it shows disasters and wars, and uh, we think Africa, for instance, but we work all over the world, but we think Africa is mostly dismal news, and there are a lot of really great people, a lot of great things happening in these places. And um, But that's not news. It wouldn't be on the news. <clears throat> it's only on the news because it's out of the ordinary. I mean, I, my goal is not to blame the news. My goal is just to go meet and see and show people who are doing great things in the world and who have great dreams just like we do here. But, but, but you're trying to change things. You're trying to, to, to have a different outcome. You know, the outcome, I think that, that we, it's been a learning curve for me, with, especially in, in having these great Nobel laureates that I've worked with and, and with Clinton Global Initiative, where I've been a member in the Skoll Forum. And, <clears throat> Ultimately, I think the outcome is that the more those of us in this country are connected to other people, the better off we are. And it doesn't necessarily mean people in East Africa, maybe mean people in East Jersey. There's give, give, give us an example, because I want folks to go on the website. Sure. It's been up throughout the entire segment. Someone goes on the website, they find out what they can, they can do what? Because this series, other than having interesting people on, is intended to move people to some action. And I'm just, I just want to be clear on well, what that could be. Well, whether it could be, you know, for instance, our, our partner projects, there's a lot of ways that they could come into action if they were inspired by watching our movies. One of the things they could do is they could get one of the movies, Nobility, One Piece at a Time, or, or Building Hope. They could watch a ton of free video that's streaming on our website and our YouTube channel and everywhere else. And they may, you know, may just enjoy it and be inspired to go do something great. They may want to participate in a water project or a library or textbooks for kids sure. in one of the places where we work. And they may have kids. They may be a school teacher. We, uh, any school teacher in the U.S., uh, public school teacher in the U.S. who signs up our teacher form, we send them our movies for free, and we uh, we connect with them. Um, the nice thing about being a nonprofit is we we don't have to make money. We the goal of what we do is to 
connect people to each other. But the other thing is the high school that you're connected mm -hmm. to there. Give us an update on what's happening there. Well, uh, I mean, Describe it for folks. Well, we built a water system at this school. I planted trees, and they had planted some trees that looked like they were, gonna, were brown, and the <laughs> principal said, well, it's a long ways to the water. And I signed each kid a tree to water, and I said, how far? It's about a mile and a half. I said, what about the water they drink at school? And he said, well, it's about a mile and a half, and, <laughs> and it, you know, it's from a, a river. It makes them sick. And I said, well, we, we need to get a water system going here. And he said, we were really trying. So we partnered with them to build a water system. And, and that water system was actually funded by a 13-year-old kid as his mitzvah project. He heard me talking about this school and came up to me and said, I want to raise that money. And the water system led to new classrooms and a computer lab and then more of a middle school. And then when we were there celebrating with the community, they said, well, you know, we don't have a high school. We would love for kids to not end their education at the eighth grade. So a lot of our work in the last three or four years has been centered around this idea that how could we possibly expect the world to get better with all these problems we face if so many kids only go to the eighth grade? And so the first class of high school students just students graduated? graduated in December. What's that and like they all you? passed their exit exams, which are very rigorous exams. What's that like for you? It's exciting. And I wish they were all going to go to college, which is, in reality, is probably not the case. A couple of them will. But they all got a high school education. They didn't <clears throat> go out and be a, you know, a street hustler after, after the eighth grade or just have to figure out some way to scrounge money. These kids, they can do things. They have computer skills. They love books. They, uh, one of our kids... Uh, the the basketball court, rainwater court, we won an international design award and, a, and got a lot of money from Nike to build this building. It's a basketball court. The big roof that collects rainwater and provides the drinking water for the school. That taught the kids to play basketball and one of those kids is now a walk-on player at Kampala International University. You're doing good things. Sorry for cutting you off. Appreciate you coming in. Thanks. Good stuff. Yeah, one on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Sun National Bank, Qualcare Inc., New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, PSE&G, Fedway Associates Inc., the Russell Berry Foundation, and by Cone Resnick. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. A business relationship with Sun National Bank is the difference between night and day. A great energy rises from New Jersey. It's the pulse of industry, the tempo of technology, the pace of today's entrepreneurs, the best of tomorrow. It's the sound of progress, and we're the bank that's powering it. The financial fuel behind thousands of commercial and small businesses just happens to be Sun. We're Sun National Bank. The difference is night and day.